Shall we turn to the word of God? We have reached in our studies the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, and we're going to read the first 19 verses. You'll find a copy of Luke's Gospel right there in front of you. Luke 17, verses 1 to 19. Jesus said to his disciples, things that make people fall into sin are bound to happen, but how terrible for the one who makes them happen. It would be better for him if a large millstone were tied round his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in one day, and each time he comes to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, Make our faith greater. And the Lord answered, If you had faith as big as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, pull yourself up by the roots and plant yourself in the sea and it would obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant who is plowing or looking after sheep. When he comes in from the field, do you say to him, hurry along and eat your meal? Of course not. Instead you say to him, get my supper ready. Then put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. The servant does not deserve thanks for obeying orders, does he? It is the same with you. When you have done all you have been told to do, say, we are ordinary servants. We have only done our duty. As Jesus made his way to Jerusalem, he went between Samaria and Galilee. He was going into a village when he was met by ten lepers. They stood at a distance and shouted, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus saw them and said to them, Go and let the priests examine you. On the way, they were made clean. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him. The man was a Samaritan. Jesus spoke up. There were ten men who were made clean. Where are the other nine? Why is this foreigner the only one who came back to give thanks to God? And Jesus said to him, Get up and go. Your faith has made you well. It took Jesus three years to turn fishermen into fishers of men. Three full-time years of training. There's no shortcut to Christian service. And yet the training was not given in some cloistered monastery or in some Bible college. Most of the training was given quite incidentally as they lived among men. There were some formal sermons, and that was a vital part of Jesus' teaching, but a very great number of the lessons he taught sprang out of life situations, and other lessons were given in just a few sentences as they walked along the road. That is the ideal way of training. If you have not been able to go away to Bible college or theological seminary, don't necessarily envy those who have. They're not the best places to learn to be a Christian. I speak from experience. The teaching that Jesus wants to give us is the kind he gave the disciples. And while he calls some to concentrated academic studies so that they may have a ministry of teaching, for most of his disciples, his training will be given in a combination of formal sermons life situations and those little lessons that he wants to give to us little by little in daily life. And if you are walking and talking with Jesus as you go through life, 
three years of living with him can train you to be a fisher of men. There will be sermons that you'll hear, formal discourses on certain truths. You're listening to one now. But if that's the only training you get from the Lord Jesus, it's not enough. You will become a listener, a passive sermon taster only. It is as you let life situations on Monday morning and Tuesday and Wednesday become a channel for Jesus telling you something about yourself, about other people. And it is as you are always prepared to listen for that occasional word from Jesus, which is a whole sermon in itself, like a blinding flash, some truth comes through to you. Now remember that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem in Luke 17. Time is desperately short. He may not have much longer. He knows he won't have much longer to teach these disciples. And so he's desperately trying to give them lessons in how to follow him. Some of them spring out of life. Others he slips in a sermon that is only five sentences long and gives them a profound lesson in how to be a Christian. And there are three lessons we're going to learn this morning from Jesus. First, a lesson on sin. Second, a lesson on faith. And third, a lesson on thanks. And these are three very simple lessons that all of us need to learn if we're going to be good followers of the Lord Jesus and become fishers of men and become apostles who are able to help other people. And first, a little lesson on sin. I'm sure you all realize how serious it is for a Christian to sin himself. But there is one thing that God regards as far more serious than that. Something that is far worse than sinning yourself, and that is to make someone else sin. Indeed, it would be better for you to be dead than doing that. And this word comes very deeply to us and challenges us all. There was a man who lay on his deathbed dying and a minister was talking to him as he died. And this man had one thing on his conscience that he could not forget. And it was weighing him down in the moment of death. And you may think it was such a silly and simple thing, but this is what it was. As an elderly man on his deathbed, he remembered that as a young boy, he had once gone to the crossroads outside the village where he lived and taken the signpost at the crossroads and forced it round in its socket so that the arms were pointing down the wrong roads. I'm not going to say hands up all those who've done this, but I dare say there are quite a few. I think I'm right. But when this man lay dying, he couldn't get it off his conscience that he may have misled many people, caused people to go out of their way, caused people to miss appointments, to waste hours, and this came back on him as a dying man. That he had done something which could have misled other people. And I'm not surprised it came back so forcibly to him. For Jesus is saying here, this is even more serious than to do something wrong yourself, and that is to lead somebody else to do wrong. Now, Jesus said it is inevitable that this will happen in our world. Occasions for such things must occur. Why is it inevitable? It's inevitable because we copy each other. It's inevitable because crowded on this planet, we are not living, each of us, on a desert island. No man lives to himself, and all of us, for better or worse, influence other people. We cannot help it. Others will copy us. Others will take a cue from us. We do that with dress. We do it with language. All these things we pick up from someone else. I suppose the outstanding example of this is the relationship between parents and children. How much your children pick up from you as parent. They learn most of their vocabulary from you. They learn most of their habits from you. But it's not just between parents and children. As we go through life, we influence each other. Our behavior affects other people. 
And therefore one of the saddest burdens all of us have in our conscience is this. How many other people have sinned because of me? It's a sobering thought. Where do people learn to swear? Do they think that up themselves? No. They copy other people. And they think it's big to do this. You think of most of the sins you've done, and did you not learn most of them from someone else? We're not that original, even though we've got original sin in us. We are not able to think up new things so easily. We pick them up from the mass media, from our personal friends, and when we get in a gang of friends, then we all influence each other, and we either lift each other up or we drag each other down. We are all like sheep. Yesterday afternoon, our family and another family in this church went out to the sheep in the fields on a farm and were looking at the lambs and how lovely it is to see them. But if you ever watch sheep, if one finds a hole in a fence, all the others will follow. They really follow each other. All we like sheep have gone astray, says the Bible. It just needs one to do something and the rest will do it. And so Jesus said, it's inevitable that this will happen. We are so made that we can't help influencing other people and we can't help copying other people. And therefore such things are bound to happen, but woe to the, those who do it. Now how do we lead other people astray? I can think of at least four ways in which we do it. Number one, by straight example. They see us doing a thing and they say it must be all right so I can do it. That's number one. Number two is in teaching. We can, in fact, by what we say, alter the standards of God and say, oh, well, we're modern now and the standards of God are old-fashioned and so we don't now need to observe these principles. And that kind of teaching, which is very widespread today, is causing other people to stray. Jesus had some very severe words for those who relax one little bit of God's laws. Funnily enough, we can also cause people to sin by tightening God's standards and by making stricter standards for people than God made. That's the opposite way of doing it, but the Pharisees did it this way, and they had such traditions that they were narrower than God, and the result was that most people just gave up and giving up on the traditions, they gave up on the principles and they became technically known as sinners. That's the label given to them in the Bible days because some people had made the standards so strict that people were just giving up and therefore sinning in all ways. And a fourth way in which we can do this is by provocation. I may say to someone or say about someone, you know, I can see their besetting sin, it's bad temper. What I may not be aware of is that I provoked them to that bad temper and that I stimulated it and that it was really my attitude or action which caused them to lose their temper so that in a host of ways as we go through life we can be making others sin and Jesus said it would be better for you to have a millstone round your neck now, do some of you remember seeing the millstones on the edge of the Sea of Galilee? Black basalt rock, about a yard across and about a foot thick with a hole in the middle. If you had one of those around your neck, you wouldn't even get to the seashore. Never mind get in. But if others took you to the seashore and tied that around your neck and threw you in, you wouldn't stand a chance. But Jesus is saying there is a fate worse than death. There's one thing worse than dying, and that is to live with the knowledge that you led others astray and to know that one day God will face you with that responsibility. So the old man, thinking of that signpost that he turned round, take that as a picture, for we stand as signposts. We're much the same shape if we just do that. And we are pointing in directions that other people will follow. Now that's the negative side of the lesson on sin. The positive side of the lesson, and each of these three things that we're studying this morning, there's a negative lesson and a positive lesson. The negative lesson is this. Are you adding to the world's sin in other people? Are you piling it up? Are you leading astray? The positive lesson is, or are you one of those who is a little center of life 
neutralizing sin, reducing it, dealing with it and removing it. Every one of us in this church is either a person who's adding to sin by encouraging it, by leading others to do it, or we are reducing it and removing it from the human scene. Now, how do you remove it? The answer is by rebuking it and forgiving it. That's how you remove it. That's how we reduce this pile of sin in the world, by rebuking it and by forgiving it. Now, let's take the first, rebuking it. One of the most awful dangers that we have is this, that when we see sin, that we talk about it to everybody but the one responsible for it. And that is an unspiritual and an unchristian attitude. The Bible makes it quite clear that if you see sin, there is only one person you should talk to about it, and that is the person themselves. You shouldn't go to anyone else, you shouldn't gossip about it, you shouldn't <laughs> criticize them behind their backs. You should go to that person themselves and say, and in love rebuke it. To do anything else is an unchristian attitude. The person who has the courage and love to go to the person direct is the person who will remove sin from the human scene and not add to it. And far from putting sin into another person's life, will be removing it from their life. And secondly, when the person repents to, to forgive. I have noticed in life this simple fact, and I pass it on to you as an observation of Christian fellowship. Those who have enough love to forgive are those who have enough love to rebuke. Those who don't have enough love to rebuke don't have enough love to forgive. The two go together. Both are demonstrations of love. And in fact, those who don't speak to a person themselves but talk behind a person's back are those who will be resentful and unforgiving in spirit. The two go together again. And so here we are, and Jesus said, this is the lesson I want you to learn. I do not want you to be adding to the sins of other people's lives, but taking the sins of other people away, reducing the heap of evil in the world, not increasing it, not causing sin, but curing it. Now, it's very difficult to forgive someone else because it involves forgetting it and putting it right out of your relationship, right out of your mind. And Jesus gives us some guidance about how many times we may have to do this. Do you know, it says something for our lack of spirituality that a person who may have offended us three times is somebody we then can't forgive. In fact, the Jewish rabbis used to say, and I've got their teaching for this, the Jewish rabbis of our Lord's day said this, if you can forgive your brother three times in one day, then you are a perfect man. And Jesus said seven times in one day. I think that pretty well covers every relationship you've got. I'd be surprised if you could tell me that somebody has sinned against you more than seven times a day. I did a little mathematics. That's uh, 140, no, it isn't. It's 49 times a week, right? How many times a year is it? 2,555, right? And that's with one person. That's with one person. I once heard a Christian say this, just wait till he does it the 491st time <laughs> because he'd been reading unto 70 times 7 and he'd been working that out, that's 490. Right, just wait till he does it the 491st time. But what Jesus is saying is, look, you don't count. Even if the same person sins against you seven times a day, you still go to him seven times, and if he says, I'm sorry, you say, right, that's forgiven and forgotten, and it's dealt with. And the reason for doing this is, of course, isn't that how you hope the Lord will deal with you? When we say the Lord's Prayer, and we've said it already once this morning, there is only one thing in that prayer we say about ourselves. Have you noticed that? There is only one profession that you make about your own Christian life in that prayer. There's only one thing you claim to be in that prayer as a ground for asking the Lord to hear your prayer. There's only one ground 
on which you pray the Lord's Prayer, and it's this, I have forgiven those who've trespassed against me. It's the only thing you claim when you ask for God's mercy, that you have been merciful. It's a sobering thought. But insofar as you've been merciful to others, then God is able to give you mercy. It's not because it's a bargain. It's not because showing mercy deserve God's mercy. It's as I've said before, it is a, an electrical circuit. And God's forgiveness can't flow until the circuit is complete. And if I do not allow his mercy to flow through me to other people, the circuit is not complete and his mercy can't flow. And so we're saying in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, I've completed the circuit on my side. Now forgive us our trespasses. Unto 70 times 7. Well, here's lesson number one, and it's a sobering lesson for all of us, and it's this. If we cause others to sin, we're doing something even more serious than sinning ourselves. And the last verse of Romans 1, after describing some pretty horrible features of social life in the Roman Empire, which are very common to social life today, Paul says, and these people who do such things not only do them themselves, but encourage others to do them also. As much as to say, that is the depth of depravity. Not when you've reached rock bottom yourself and wallow in the mud yourself, but when you want to drag everybody down to your level. And that's more serious. Far better to be out of this world altogether, to be drowned in the depths of the sea. It really would be better for a person to be in the bottom of the sea dead than to be living and doing that kind of thing. But the positive thing that we are to be doing is to rebuke sin and to forgive it. We are to forgive and forget. And then we're reducing the sin around us and we're being a follower of Jesus. Now the second lesson that we're going to learn this morning is in faith. I would guess that the reason why the disciples said immediately after lesson number one, Lord, increase our faith, was just this. Who's sufficient for these things? Who's a Christian like this? Who's as good as this? Lord, we'll never make it that kind of standard. That's just too much for us. Seven times a day, the same man. Oh, Lord, we just don't have enough faith to do that. Lord, increase our faith. Now, at first sight, this prayer is a prayer we'd all want to pray. It's a very beautiful prayer, we think. It's a prayer that's right and good. Surely that's our very need. Surely the whole basis of the Christian life is faith. It's from faith to faith. Surely the one thing we need is more and more faith. Surely that's how we're going to build up our whole Christian life, on faith. And therefore, Lord, if we're going to ever reach the standard of forgiving each other and rebuking each other, give us more faith. Make us stronger believers. And yet you know there's something seriously wrong with the prayer, Lord, increase our faith. Now, it's not that you can't have a bigger faith. There are degrees of faith. Paul in Romans 12 says, let everybody think soberly according to the measure of faith given him. And Jesus talked to, oh, you of little faith, and I have not met such great faith, no, not in Israel. Yes, there are degrees of faith, and what's wrong when you're conscious that you're only a little believer of saying, Lord, make me a big believer? You read the life of Hudson Taylor, you read the life of George Muller, and you say, oh, Lord, these were men of great faith. Lord, increase our faith. Surely that's a lovely prayer and a valid prayer. And yet our Lord rebuked the prayer. And corrected it. Because there's something profoundly wrong with this prayer. Do you know what it is? It's a prayer that seeks to shift the responsibility from us to God. And that's what's wrong with it. It's saying, Lord, we're inadequate, so you do it. Now again, at first sight, surely that's a valid prayer. That's that's how we ought to pray, surely. We ought to acknowledge our own unworthiness, inadequacy, and hand it all over to God and say, you'll have to do it because we can't. With men it's impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. If we're not careful, our prayers get into this habit of thought of passing the responsibility over to God and saying, Lord, increase our faith. You do it. 
And the Lord's rebuke comes in this simple lesson on faith. It's not enlarging that your faith needs, it's exercising. It's like a little boy who wants to be a Mr. Universe. And he looks in the mirror and he doesn't see rippling muscles and, and big chest and he can't sort of pose in front of the mirror as they do and, and really admire himself. So he, he decides to pray every morning and he says, Lord Jesus, give me a big body like Mr. Universe. Lord, give me a bigger muscles. And he prays so earnestly. And he prays every day, month in, month out, and he keeps looking in the mirror to see if his prayer is answered. And it isn't answered. And the Lord is saying, it's not an enlargement that you need, it's exercising that you need. Why don't you use the muscles you've got? Why don't you exercise the muscle you have? That's the way to enlargement, not for me to enlarge it, but for you to. And a lot of our prayers need serious examination at this point. If we're not passing the buck to him, and trying to make him do what we should be doing in our prayer. And it is so in this matter of faith. Lord, give us a bigger faith. And Jesus says, use the little faith you've got. It's not a bigger faith you need. It's to exercise the little faith I've already given. That's the way to a stronger Christian life. To exercise what you've already received. And Jesus said, your faith may be no bigger than a mustard seed. And that is the tiniest thing. We would say a speck or a pinhead in our language. But if, if in their days they wanted to say something very tiny, they would always say like a, a grain of mustard seed. And if you look at it on your hand, you can only just see it with good eyesight. Tiny little speck. And Jesus said, it's not a bigger faith you need. Take that tiny little faith that you've got and do something with it. You see, the mustard seed, if somebody gave you a mustard seed and you said, but look, I want a tree, I want a tree, I'm asking for a tree, and the person says, I've given you one. Take that tiny thing I've given you and do the proper thing with it and put it in the soil, that tiny thing has life in it, use it, put it in the soil and you've got your tree. And those who keep praying for bigger faith like the great spiritual giants of the past, Jesus saying, take the faith I've given you let each man think soberly according to the measure of faith he has and let him use that faith. And goes on, Paul goes on to say, if, if you've been given a gift of prophecy, then use it according to your faith, but use it. And it's one of the most profound spiritual principles that you get stuck spiritually if you don't use what you have. And it's no use praying for more. And it's no use asking God to pour more. If you're not using what you have, then God says that's the answer. And he said if your faith was only very tiny and you were prepared to use it, you could speak to a mulberry tree, which, by the way, has the strongest roots of any tree in Palestine. And there's a proverb in the Middle East that a mulberry tree can hold on for 600 years. And it's got very strong roots. And you could say to that mulberry tree, get up and go. And it would go and plant itself in the sea. And all you would need to do would be to speak. Now let's not water down what Jesus said. Let's not spiritualize it and say he's speaking of the mulberry tree of worry or the mulberry tree of this, that, and the other. Let's take it as he said it quite literally. People sometimes accuse me of being a literalist. Well, there are some things in the Bible I don't take literally because the Bible itself doesn't take them literally. If I was a literalist through and through, I would believe there'd only be animals in heaven because it says that in the last day he will divide the sheep from the goats and take the sheep to heaven and send the goats elsewhere. That's literalism, and I'm not a literalist. But on the other hand, where a simple, straightforward statement in fact is made, I'm a literalist and I take it literally. And I'm not going to spiritualize this text because Jesus said you could talk to a tree and tell it to go and it would move if you exercised faith that big. wonder what your reaction to this is. I'm going to read you a bit now from this month's Reader's Digest. The book choice this month is a book by Eugene Morse called Escape to Hidden Valley and the blurb at the beginning says this 
The Morse family, missionaries in the Far East for 50 years, had seen their work threatened many times as waves of war and revolution swept over China and Burma. When in 1965 they were banished forever from the land they loved, their exodus led them high into the Himalayas where civilized man had never penetrated. There, with faith, ingenuity, and hard work, they and their friends of the Burmese hill tribes set about building what promised to become their own Shangri-La. Now, in that hidden valley, way up in the Himalaya mountains, they found a hidden valley, and they cleared bits of jungle and planted the little bit of corn they'd got left, little bit of rice, and hid up in the hills. And this happened the first year. Through the rains we prayed for a bountiful harvest and when the fields began to ripen it looked as if our prayers had been answered. Then one day the headman of Zeyudi, Herr Atze, reported seeing some caterpillars in his fields. What happened next was recorded by our 15 year old son Ronnie. Quote, they didn't seem to be a danger at the beginning as they were only a quarter of an inch long. But in a week they had trebled in size and the rice was a husk. Still the head man wasn't worried thinking they would soon go away but they spread out and grew till the whole field was stubble. Soon everybody woke up to the danger. There's no way to describe it. It chilled my blood. Ever creeping, ever eating, as many as 10 to 20 were racing up and down a single clump of rice plant, steadily reducing the field to waste. There was no remedy. The only thing left to do was pray, which we did. Yet the plague spread till almost every field was full of the things. Most people tried to save their fields. They would let their chickens loose. But though they ate their fill, hardly a dent was noticeable in the marching caterpillar population. One family went into their field, men, women and children, and from early dawn to late at night put caterpillars into their baskets. When a basket about a bushel was full, they would bury them. They would gather as much as three bushels a day just from one field. Then word came that the other settlements were experiencing the same trouble. This was very bad news. Finally, all the villagers came together to choose a course of action. It was decided that one person from each family would come and together they would go from field to field singing and praying for deliverance from the pests. We all knew that only God could save the crops now. After we did the touring, we waited for God to show his hand. Our faith was put to a test. That the Lord would save the crops, we were certain. But how or when, we did not know. One day passed, then two, and that evening some people testified that there didn't seem to be quite so many caterpillars. Another said he saw some birds in the field and it looked as if they were pecking at the caterpillars. These observations strengthened our faith. So we prayed even more earnestly that night for complete deliverance. The next day, the third day, I went out early into the fields to have a look. Slowly I began to search the plants for caterpillars. No sign anywhere. All that day, we kept our eyes on the fields, hardly daring to believe what our eyes saw. Everywhere, people were waking up to find that the pests were gone. What rejoicing and praising. We had seen God in action and felt the power of his word. You can talk to caterpillars with faith that big. We're speaking literally now, you see. And I want you to notice that nothing happened as long as they stuck to prayer in this situation. Did you notice that? They prayed, but the plague continued. But then they acted. They met together to decide a course of action. And their faith became expressed not just in earnest prayer, but in marching round the field singing to the caterpillars. What a foolish thing to do. What utter fools they would look. And that's why James 2 says faith without actions is dead. And I believe that the real reason why Christians get stuck, 
the real reasons why we do not see more is not necessarily the lack of earnest prayer that God will do more. It may be that we are not exercising the little that God has already given us, acting on it and using what is given. I believe this applies to the gifts of the Spirit. I believe it applies to the graces of the Spirit. Lord, give me more patience. Are you using what I've already given you? Lord, give me more love. Are you using what I've already given you? Lord, we need more money. Are you using the money I've already given you as I want it used? Lord, give us revival. Are you using the revival I've already given? Do you see what I mean? It's a lesson in faith. Not just to pray big, but to act big. Not to throw it back on the Lord and say, Lord, you do more with us. But to respond to the Lord's challenge, you do more with what I've given you. And see what happens. And the glorious thing is that your faith increases as you use it. Your gifts increase as you use them. Your graces increase as you use them. Your spiritual muscles get bigger as you exercise them. And faith is a kind of spiritual muscle. Now the third lesson that we've got to learn this morning is a lesson about thanks. It follows from this one because supposing we do enlarge our faith by exercise, supposing we do do more in the name of the Lord, supposing we do see things happening, supposing we are doing more ourselves, the greatest danger then is that God having thrown the responsibility back on us and we having accepted it and exercised ourselves that we then expect thanks for it. And here is one of the most subtle dangers that comes, the little Jack Horner syndrome, who put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I, for plum substitutes some gift or grace, and you've got the picture. Now the two things we need to learn about thanks, on the negative side, don't expect any. On the positive side, oh, learn to give thanks to the Lord. Let's take the negative side first. A most extraordinary story that um, Jesus tells here that uh, really is quite shattering and we're going to have to work out the practical implications of it. It's this. Never, never expect to be thanked for what you do for the Lord. Because if you receive thanks for what you're doing for the Lord, it assumes that you've been doing a favor and not a duty. Because you are not thanked for doing your duty, you are only thanked for doing favors. And therefore it's the most dangerous thing to be thanked for doing something that was your duty. May I speak very personally and frankly. Some people after a sermon have sometimes made a comment to me. I want to be very understanding if I can here and have begun their comment by saying, I know you don't like to be thanked, but... Now, can I say that they've got me wrong? The real problem is I do like to be thanked. It's by nature that I like to be thanked. It's by grace that I know I don't like to be and ought not to be. I'm only preaching to you this morning because it's my duty. It's my down-to-earth duty, and if I wasn't doing it as a duty to the Lord, I shouldn't be doing it. If he told me to be here preaching, then I'm just obeying orders. If he didn't tell me, then I shouldn't be here. Can you see the simplicity of that? And Jesus taught us to think like this and beware. Now let me say straight away that there is a ministry of encouragement we are told to exercise in the scripture. We are to encourage one another. That's a different thing from thanking one another. To encourage one another is to say the Lord has used you to bless me. And in that way you're giving glory to the Lord and you're encouraging the person. Do you see that? But to thank the person for doing it is to put them in a dangerous position spiritually. And the Lord says, which of you has a servant and sends him out to look after your sheep or to plow? And by the way, those are the two main Christian jobs there are. Plowing is evangelism, breaking up fresh ground, and looking after the sheep is pastoral work. And all Christian service comes under plowing or sheep shepherding. If you have a, a servant and you send him to plow or to look after your sheep, when he comes back to you, shake his hand and say, oh, thank you so much for looking after my sheep. Thank you so much for plowing. Does your boss say that to you regularly? 
say, oh, I'm really so grateful to you for doing me that favor. Now sit down, let me get, let me get some food for you. No, a master who owns a servant says, now you finish plowing, get my real meal ready. And only after he's finished all the duties can he sit down and enjoy the meal himself. It's a very hard saying and a difficult one to accept and apply. But look, Jesus has a feast prepared for in, us in heaven, but that's at the end of the day. Our duty at the moment is to do our duty and to serve him. We can sit down at the feast when we've finished our duty, but Jesus said, even when you've done your level best, don't think you've done God a favor and don't think you've got him in your debt. He has still spent more on you than he's got back from you. You are still unprofitable servants. And so even when you've put your very best effort into it, don't allow yourself to be thanked. Do be encouraged in the Lord, but don't allow yourself to be thanked. I ask this very serious question. Is there any place in church life for votes of thanks? I'm really trying to apply this in our situation. I know we're given to it. Thank the ladies for preparing the meal. Thanks at the AGM of every organization to those who are going out of office. But should we do it? I seriously ask that. Or should we praise God that they've done their duty? Should anyone be in any job, in the pulpit, in the choir, at the organ, giving out hymn books, in the Sunday school, preparing in the kitchen meals, doing anything at all in the church, should they be doing it if it's not their duty as a servant of the Lord? And if they're doing it as a duty to him, should they be thanked for it? Or should they say, even I've done my best and I know it's still not good enough and it still doesn't repay the Lord for all he's done for me? If I may say so on behalf of those of us you've called to Christian service in this church, Thank you for giving us a chance to do our duty. The thanks should be on that side, if any. Have you ever noticed that throughout the Bible, from cover to cover, neither God nor Jesus ever thanked anybody for what they asked to be done? Not once. There is not a recorded case, to my knowledge, of God ever saying, thank you so much for doing that for me. There is not a recorded case of Jesus ever asking for something and then saying, thank you so much for doing it. Jesus said, go and you'll find a donkey. I need that donkey. Just say, the Lord needs him. That's all you need to say. Don't thank him for letting it go. Just say, the Lord needs it. That's the relationship between us and the Lord. If we do our duty as servants, don't expect thanks. Otherwise, you've got a mental outlook that is saying, I've been doing the church a favor in doing this. I've been doing the Sunday school a favor. I've been doing the choir a favor. I've been doing somebody a favor. You haven't. You've done your duty to the Lord. And there's a feast. One day he'll say, sit down and eat and drink. You've now finished your duties to me. Now sit down and eat and drink. Great is your reward in heaven. But thanks on earth, no. But on the other hand, Let's learn the positive lesson because if we stopped at this point we could become unthankful people and that would be devastating for us. We are to be full of gratitude and full of thanks but the thanks should go where they belong. Praise the Lord for those who do their duty. Praise the Lord for those who faithfully serve him in this place. Praise the Lord for it because it's the Lord who told them to do it. Praise the Lord that he supplies workers in his vineyard. We're going to induct an elder this morning. Praise the Lord. The Lord has told this elder to do this job. And praise the Lord that he's going to do his duty. And that's where the praise and the thanks should be constantly going. And it comes out in a little story of ten lepers. I've never had much to do personally with people suffering from leprosy. I've seen many harrowing pictures. I've heard missionaries speak of this dreadful condition where the body is not only in a very sad condition which is becoming more and more grotesque, but where this very physical condition is going to cut that person off from social contact, even from their own family, and make them an outcast. It's a horrible condition. Thank God that so many Christians have done so much for the mission to lepers and others who've gone out to relieve this condition. In our Lord's day, there were no sulfur drugs to meet this need. In our Lord's day, there was no cure. They were just pushed out and they had to live 
away from people. They tended to live on the borders between different countries so that if this country shouted at them, they stepped over that border. And if this country shouted, they stepped over that border, rather like the gypsy caravan settlements in this country. And that's why when Jesus was walking along the borders between Galilee and Samaria, he met a bunch of these people, both Jews from Galilee and a Samaritan, in common tragedy, together living on the borders so that they could jump one way or the other when they were not liked. And they kept a hundred paces away from Jesus. That was the regulation, a hundred paces away. And they called to him and they said, Jesus, have pity Oh, there were men of prayer. They prayed as hard that day as never before because Jesus was passing by and they must have heard that he could heal lepers and not just remove their physical condition but put them back in their families and society. Jesus, have pity on us. Here are men of prayer. And they weren't just saying prayers. They were pleading with Jesus. Have mercy on us. Jesus, heal us. Our only chance of getting back into life. Will you do it? And Jesus healed them in a way that he heals so many. He made them exercise the little faith they had. He didn't say, right, come here and I'll touch you. Not on this occasion. He said, go and have a medical inspection in Jerusalem. That was the procedure then. Go and show yourself to the priest. Go on. And as they walked along, one of them looked at his hands. He said, look, look, look as they walked, as they went. In other words, the faith that he made them exercise was to walk in the direction of the medical inspector. And as they obeyed Jesus and believed, something happened. That's how faith operates. They obviously had a little faith in Jesus or they wouldn't have asked him to help them and so Jesus made them exercise the faith he had. When Jesus met a man lying on the floor, he didn't say, look, let me take you by the hand and let me lift you up and let me pull you up. He said, you exercise your own faith. Get up and pick your bed up. You see the principle of faith coming through. It's not more faith we need. Exercise the bit you've got. Act on it. And as you go, you are healed. And as you act on it, it happens. And so they were healed. Now it's a lovely story and we could finish the story there, but it's got a sad ending. All ten discovered that their flesh was healing and that their skin was the discoloring was going and, and, and nine of them began to run in the wrong direction. They went heading on for the medical inspector. One stopped. He watched the other nine running ahead and he looked back. And one came back. He fell on the ground and he praised God with a loud voice. Not even Jesus. He praised God with a loud voice. My, when you've really had the touch of the divine on you, you tend to be much louder. You really do. You lift up your voice. I think one of the reasons for our soft praying and our quiet worship and our so dignified approach is that we haven't had this kind of touch. People tend to get louder. Praise God with a loud voice. Lifted up his voice. If you're excited, you lift up your voice. You don't whisper when you're excited. And he praised God with a loud voice. And he uttered thanks to the God who touched him. And he was the only one of the ten who hadn't been brought up within the people of God. It's a sad fact that those of us who've been brought up in the people of God are sometimes less full of praise and thanks than those who haven't had that background and those who've come to it fresh and those who've had a touch of the divine. We tend to take answers for, for prayer for granted, but those to whom it's new and fresh tend to praise God more fully. And Jesus said, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? There's a lovely psalm. Is it 104 or 107? I can't just remember for the moment. You know that psalm, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. They go into the desert, they're parched, they're dying of thirst, and they pray, and the Lord meets their need and saves them in their distress. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. They're in dungeons, they're chained, the gates have closed on them, and they pray in prison to God, and he releases them. And answers their cry, oh, that men would praise the Lord. 
They go down to the sea in ships and great waves rise up and they're tossed to and fro like drunken men. And they cry to the Lord in their distress and my how people at sea pray. In small boats I've seen big strong fishermen up in the Shetland Isles cry out to God. Oh, when you're battling with the elements of the sea and they cry and God sends peace and brings them to their desired haven. But oh, that men would praise the Lord. It's men of praise God wants, not just men of prayer. It's not just those who say, Lord, increase our faith. It's not just say, Lord, have pity on us. It's those who come back and say, Lord, thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He's done it. It's that praise that the Lord waits for. Don't expect thanks, but oh, do give thanks. Getting thanks should not be our concern, and we've really touched rock bottom in spirituality if we're resentful or hurt because we weren't thanked when we gave up the job. But let's be those who give thanks so that if we're doing a job, give thanks that you've been given a chance to do it. And when somebody else takes it over, give thanks that somebody else is going to have the privilege of serving the Lord. But in everything, give thanks and even your needs. Let the Lord know your needs by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Read that lovely little book, Prison to Praise. It doesn't give a complete picture of the Christian life and it isn't a deep book. And it, but it says one simple thing very clearly. And that is, oh, that men would praise the Lord. Oh, that we'd come back and give thanks. And the people who are the best servants of the Lord are not those who are looking for thanks, but those just full of gratitude that they can serve. And that they can do it, whether anybody sees it or not, whether anybody shows appreciation or not. Oh, just thank you, Lord, I can do it. It's only my duty. And even when I'm finished, I know it's still not good enough. But Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've had three very simple lessons this morning. And from them we can draw this contrasted picture. On the one side we see a Christian, a follower of Jesus, who is misleading his fellow Christians and causing them to sin and adding to their troubles. We see a Christian who's constantly praying great and noble prayers, Lord, increase our faith, Lord, do greater things but is not exercising what he has. And we see a Christian who will be offended if he isn't extended a vote of thanks that's minuted in the church minutes when he gives up the job. And you see a Christian who's not going to be a very good disciple. And on the other hand, I see another Christian who's a forgiving Christian, who's curing sin in other people, removing it from others' lives, and I see a believing Christian who's not praying a lot of startling prayers, but who's getting on and exercising the things that God has given. And I see a Christian who's just always thanking God and just grateful for the privilege of service. And I know which Christian in my heart I'd like to be, and I know which Christian I'd like to work with, and I know which Christian is going to glorify the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for dealing with us so honestly and so directly. We do confess before you that you show us ourselves. All of us have made it easier for other people to do wrong. We've all prayed that you would do more in our midst, but not been prepared to do what we knew we could already. And Lord, we've all been just a little pleased when somebody said thank you to us. And we've not always been as ready as we should have been to say thank you to yourself. Lord, we're not going to pray this morning that you'll give us a bigger faith. We just pray that you'll help us to be faithful, forgiving servants, doing our best for you as our duty, for Christ's sake. Amen.
the hymn number 596. May the mind of Christ, my Saviour, live in me from day to day. 596.